Opinions expressed are those of the speakers as of the date of the recording and are subject to change without notice and do not necessarily reflect Mercer's opinions. Welcome to the latest conversation from Mercer about private markets. I'm Natalie Breen from CityWire and today we're asking, are private markets the new investment darling? To help me shed light on this, I'm joined by Anja Manchek, Principal for Private Equity Investments in Europe at Mercer, Adam Harrison, Chief Commercial Officer at Titan Bay, Leslie Uzan, Head of Private Equity and Debt at St. James's Place here in London, Greta Teot, Head of Private Markets for Mediobanca in Italy, and Olivier Dalman, the Head of Private Markets and Investor Relations for Indo Suez. Thank you all very much for joining me today. Let's get into it and start at the beginning of exploring why private markets are potentially the new investment, darling. Anya, I'm going to come to you first. Why are private markets interesting to investors? Sure. Uh, I think for the last few years, right, we've seen private markets be a particularly hot area for investors across the world and also across different investor types. I think from the client's perspective, if we think about it, it's a real um, area of alpha generation. So the area where you can get true performance these days, I think private markets have sustainably outperformed public markets. That gap has narrowed. Uh, over time as there has been more competition in the markets, but we think for various structural reasons that that gap will persist. Um, and also secondly, I think from the bank's perspective and the advisor's perspective, it's really the way to both retain and attract clients in today's highly competitive world, because it's very hard to compete um, with a fixed income or a listed, uh, listed equities product today. You really, I think, have to offer that private market access. Adam, do you, do you agree? Why do you think they're interesting right now in particular? I, I agree with all of that. Um, I, I think, you know, the characteristics that have just been explained have been enjoyed by institutions now for decades. So it's not new in that regard. Um, but what is increasingly happening is it's becoming more widely available for a much broader client set. And I think that's also twinning with a, a, a shift that you're seeing where companies are either staying private for longer or they're choosing to become private and convert from being public. And that shift's quite meaningful. And I think there's a realisation in those that are investing that if they actually want to have a portfolio that reflects the real economy, they do now need to start considering having exposure to private markets as well. And there seems to be a real demand from investors um, for this asset class in particular. Are you finding that there's, there's kind of the speed at which the, the asset class is kind of growing in, in popularity and demand, but is there a concern that there is perhaps a kind of widening gap between investors' appetite and demand, but their knowledge of the asset class and their knowledge of, of what it is that they're, they're getting into. Leslie, how are you finding kind of marrying or, or bridging that potential gap between demand and education, really? Yeah, no, I think that's a fair point, especially from our perspective, where most of our clients are retail clients. So historically, they would not have had access to this asset class. Most of our clients, though, all, all of our clients are advised. So um, Clearly, that really does help because their advisor can just ensure it is suitable, the risks are understood, the liquidity is understood. So that really helps to bridge the gap. But we also have a role to play as a wealth manager just to make sure the advisors have the support they need, the information they need, the education they need to be able to deliver those solutions to clients. Greta, you're nodding along there. Let's bring you in here too. How are you finding um, educating your, your clients? Obviously, they're sophisticated and knowledgeable, but do you think that they, they have enough access to the, to the information that they need? Yeah, and I, as you said, I think uh, knowledge and understanding is essential in order to be able to invest in private markets. At Mediobanca, we follow a wide range of different uh, investor types. Many of them are professional investors, 
and their appetite for private markets has been increasing a lot in the past few years. So I think we saw some changes uh, in terms of demand uh, as investors are becoming more sophisticated. What we see is that they are requiring more transparency on the underlying products. Uh, they also want to have an active role uh, in building their portfolios. Uh, so we're addressing these changing demand by one on one side, providing a lot of visibility and on the other side, um, uh, let's say engaging with the clients in uh, construction of the products and customization of, uh, of their activity. Um, we also ensure that they have the necessary knowledge by doing a lot of education. So not uh, offering a specific product, uh, but rather walking them uh, through the benefits and risks uh, of private markets. Olivier, do you have a similar, similar client bank here to, to Greta? And how are you finding your clients' understanding of private markets? Yeah, absolutely. And, and today the question is, is much more on how do they invest in private equity more than why uh, investing in, in private equity. Uh, we do run a number of, uh, of workshops uh, with them, uh, trying to, to show them how we select co-investments, what's the due diligence on a private equity fund, what is the relationship uh, between the, the investors, the, the LPs and the, the GPs currently, and the, the evolution of the, of the trend. So it's a lot about educating. Uh, more and more people are uh, advising on, on private equity. I think it's a, it's a great thing for, for the end clients. Um, I think the, the high net worth is, is a great opportunity for this market. And uh, uh, the BCG uh, recently said that uh, roughly 10% of the assets will be uh, uh, raised from this, uh, this LP population. So uh, we expect a lot from uh, the high net worth individuals uh, in the next five years to come, roughly 20% growth per annum for, for, this, uh, uh, for this investor type. And it's, it's both an opportunity and a responsibility for, for us as well wealth manager to proper, properly walk them through this asset class and show them the best opportunities, uh, what what makes sense for them in their portfolio. Mm. I guess if as the, the the interest and demand increases, so I guess investing in private markets obviously comes with a lot of challenges, some of which we've touched on here. Let's go into some of those in a little bit more detail. And Greta, I'll come to you again first here. What what are aside from education, what are some of the key challenges that you're facing when it comes to investing in private markets for your client bank? Yeah, I, I think one of the main obstacles for investors in Italy is, uh, um, first of all, the lack of network and local presence. So in some cases, we see that the investors lack the expertise to conduct a proper due diligence or the skills to identify the best managers. Uh, moreover, sometimes uh, they lack access uh, to uh, invest uh, in uh, oversubscribed funds. Uh, so I, I think it is essential to rely on players like Mediobanca that can leverage a broad network of relationship uh, with uh, also external players uh, and uh, other advisors uh, uh, to identify uh, emerging players, uh, uh, best, uh, the best players, uh, and also obtain access to their funds. Uh, uh, the other main obstacle, I would say, is uh, the high minimum thresholds. Uh, so traditionally, we see that funds uh, request a minimum tickets that can range from, let's say, 5 million to 10 million and above. And this is a high barrier of entry for any investor that would like to build a diversified portfolio. In this case, our role is that of designing the best structure to make sure that clients can access private markets funds with a minimum ticket that doesn't preclude an appropriate diversification. Mm -hmm. Leslie, you're nodding along there. Obviously, St. James's Place has got, what is it, close to 3 billion under management, but private markets, it's just a kind of fraction of that at the moment. How are you finding um, the challenge of investing into private markets with your clients and your partner firms, rather? Yeah, I mean, similar to what Greta mentioned, we have similar challenges. Minimum investments are an obvious one. It's really difficult for investors to just build a diversified portfolio if you have such high minimums. 
Um, but again, as mentioned, we're seeing a lot of innovation in the space, whether it's tech providers, whether it's structures, um, whether it's you know semi-liquid vehicles, there are now more and more options, more innovation. So hopefully that will sort of help overcome some of those those challenges. And then I guess there's just you know a lot of the processes that have to be adapted as well for the wealth market, whether it's onboarding, reporting, education, which we've spoken about. So yeah, there are several challenges, but none that can't be overcome. So yeah, I think it's an exciting space to be in. Olivia, you mentioned on um, one of our calls prior to this uh, about the role of tech in particular in, in um, helping you overcome some of the challenges. How are you um, deploying tech to help you in this fashion? Yeah, I think tech has, has opened a, a lot of opportunities for, uh, for, uh, for clients and also for, for wealth managers. Um, there are a number of players and, and Adam is, uh, is a very good example of what Titan Bay can do for, uh, for, for the end clients, but also on the B2B basis, talking to, to banks and, and wealth manager. Um, I think, I mean, this industry has been heavily um, focusing on, on paper-based subscription, uh, know your clients, uh, heavy documentation. So it takes a lot of time and, and technology can definitely help us um, smoothing the, the, the process here and being probably more in line with what clients uh, are expecting to see and what they are used to have uh, with the UCITS funds and, and other mutual funds that they, they experience in their portfolio. So definitely tech will help us uh, both from a subscription perspective, but also on the reporting tools, uh, because it's important to have on a look-through basis the the, uh, the analysis of the portfolio, the sectors, the geographies, the vintages that are in each uh, of our clients' portfolio, and definitely uh, tools will will help us doing this. Adam, from, from your side then, the, what is the role of tech? How is Titan Bay kind of helping to increase access for investors in private markets? So I think, you know, there, there's the platform itself as a, um, a collator of demand. And so if you think that, you know, the minimum investments that we just referred to is a prohibitor of good portfolio construction, if you can collate demand from a variety of, of, of wealth managers and their clients, then that becomes a, no, a non-issue and you can you know, build your portfolio and advise your clients to construct their portfolio in sizing that's entirely appropriate for what their needs are, not be prohibited by this minimum investment that you have to reach. So I think from a platform point of view that helps. Then when it comes to the actual tech, it, you know, in, in one word it's scale. When you consider that the, you know, the, the industry has been significantly manual historically, and you're now looking at you know, tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of new investors participating in the asset class. You've got to look at all of the operational and admin administrative procedures that sit behind there and automate them. And that's where technology can really play a part. It can take wet ink processes that take two weeks and bring it to five minutes. You know, it can provide suitability tests that take 10 minutes rather than a two hour meeting with a client. And, and that's really you know, where we've, we've really tried to focus in, in bringing these tools to wealth managers to enable them to scale the proposition and bring it to a broader audience. That's something that you've certainly been focusing in on at St James's Place. How are you kind of setting up your, your private equity programme with the scope for scale? Yeah, look, I mean, I think definitely leveraging technology seems like uh, the way to go um, for all the reasons that Adam's mentioned. I think um, going from offering daily traded funds to now offering illiquid funds that requires a lot of adaptation of all of our processes. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it's something we are definitely keen to, to leverage. And then, yeah, just carefully reviewing everything from, you know, onboarding, reporting, making sure we deliver these in the best, you know, in an industry best leading way possible, really, for, for UK wealth clients. Anya, how, from an operational side of things, how, how um, can you efficiently and effectively run a, a private equity strategy being mindful of, of scope and scale, as both Leslie and Adam have touched on? I think I, I would agree with everything that they have both said, right? And I think technology is really, is really key here, because even if you think 
once you've made the investment, so you know you've overcome all the hurdles from the KYC perspective, the subscription perspective, etc. Um, then there is still the whole cash flow management side within which in private markets is pretty complicated. You know whether it's capital uh, capital calls or the distributions. You know it's it's a space where I think you have very little credit from for. But at the same time, mistakes are very expensive and you really cannot afford to make those mistakes. And I think the easiest way to actually avoid that is through technology these days. And I think, you know, we've really moved on. Thank you. Greta, do you want to share any points there on, on kind of an operational aspect and, and, and the use of tech? Yeah, um, I totally agree with uh, what has been said. So technology is key. Uh, I think all the operational processes take a lot of time and are subject to uh, possible mistakes uh, that uh, we cannot really afford. So technology is key uh, for the development of this asset class uh, within a broader range of clients. So recently we polled um, a range of our European fund selectors when looking at private markets and finding out kind of what their attitude was, um, how, how um, involved they are at the moment. There's massive increasing demand from, from, from this, our readership there, but they said one of the key issues for them is illiquidity. And now this is something that you've all touched on at the moment, but how, how are you managing um, this both from a logistical perspective, but also from a kind of educating clients about this kind of liquidity constraint. Um, Leslie, let me come to you first on that one. I mean, I guess just to start, the one thing to mention is we are seeing a lot of innovation in the space. So there are now semi-liquid structures, which can be a little less daunting, less overwhelming for some clients, because going from here, yeah, traded daily funds to fully liquid can be a really big step. Um, having said that though, you know, there are also now more and more options, thanks to technology, for example, for clients to access fully illiquid funds. And I think the key thing there is to just make sure the risks, the liquidity is well understood. Obviously, getting advice will always help because that will just ensure the client is really suitable for the product and is comfortable that they can stay locked in for, for many years and what that means. So yeah, from our perspective, just making sure our advisors have the right tools to communicate that to clients. Olivier, how are you finding communicating um, liquidity constraints, but also managing it from a logistical point of view as well? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a key uh, factor of this uh, of this industry. We can work along uh, innovation with, with the semi-liquid products. Um, with the Picte, the Hamilton Lane, the Schroeder and a few other players with this type of, 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 uh, of funds, but it, it remains an illiquid uh, asset class. I think one answer that, that we bring is, is uh, through diversification. I mean, uh, when you have an illiquid portfolio and a, a, lot of, a lot of the net asset value is down to one sector or one company, I think it, it makes it very difficult for investors to live with this illiquidity. Uh, once you have a well-fragmented portfolio with, with thousands of, of assets um, and the biggest contribution of net asset value is only one or one and a half percent, then it makes uh, more interesting and, and probably um, you, know, you don't wait the same time for, for liquidity events. So I think the, you know, it, it's one thing that uh, we have to, to keep in mind that the minimum uh, of, per, for investments per fund, and on the other hand, the, the fact that we need to be highly diversified. And I would say uh, at least 15 funds committed uh, over 10 year time, I think it's typically what we, what we say. Um, it's therefore very difficult to time the market in this, uh, in this asset class. And, and probably more have a steady pace of, of committing to, to funds uh, on multiple vintages. That, that would be for us the main answer to prevent from, from liquidity risks. Greta, you're nodding along there. Do you have a similar, similar strategy in terms of diversification of your portfolio? Yes, we do. So um, we often look for strategies that uh, can, on one side, smoothen the J-curve. So in many products, we have inserted a portion of secondaries and co-investments, for instance. 
and we always uh, suggest the diversification across vintages uh, so that uh, the illiquidity can be sort of smoothened by the fact that uh, we might receive some distributions while having to fulfill some capital calls on the other side. Um, we're also looking at semi-liquids, uh, is for sure something that is of high interest and something that sits between the illiquid and liquid type of investments. Um, I think in any case, we always make clear that uh, this is an illiquid asset class uh, and it should be invested with a long time, long time uh, horizon. So we carefully evaluate the needs of a client in terms of liquidity to make sure that the capital invested is not needed in the short term. Thank you. Another area that came out from the survey that we did was um, the kind of burden of due diligence and the fact that the that this asset class is quite opaque. Um, and yeah, how how do you find um, the burden on internal resources in terms of digging through the opacity to find the best performing managers? I think it is clearly a challenge within private markets. Look, we're very fortunate in the sense we have large teams spread across the globe and we we genuinely do leverage those teams from a due diligence perspective so it can be it can be anything from having the history with a gp going back maybe 10 15 years which helps gives you a lot of that useful background which helps you evaluate what's happening going forward or it can also be you know just by leveraging our networks usually somebody in the firm uh, knows somebody who can give you quite a good insight, often off the list and off the record. So I think using multiple channels, we really try to dig through that uh, opacity. And I think the other th part that I would say to that is um, what really helps in, the, in that due diligence is also the experience. Because, you know, you can go into a data room and some of the very uh, established uh, GPs will will have hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents, but you don't necessarily need to go through every single page. It's really about identifying what are the key issues. And whereas, you know, there are certain points which you want to double check with every GP, but then there are there are specific issues to every manager that you really want to dig into. And I think it's about identifying those key issues and focusing your due diligence on that side rather than necessarily having to tick every single box from a long list of questions. Leslie, how are you and your team managing the, the burden of due diligence? Yeah, I mean, definitely it's a lot of work. Having a strong network is really important. We're also really focused on you know, building really good partnerships, whether it's with managers or with consultants as well. So that's something which we're really focused on. And I guess tech here uh, plays a part in being able to kind of open out the approach when it comes to, to finding the best performing GPs. Yes. Um, I mean, I think if you're a GP, the characteristic that you want of an LP is somebody that's going to be capable of committing in size but also throughout the vintages, they're looking for partners in that sense. And as a platform collating a significant amount of demand from a variety of sources, and then effectively representing them as one into that GP, we're in a very good position to fulfill that characteristic for the GP. Um, so I, 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 th I think that, that really helps. I think in terms of due diligence as well, um, if we're doing that and having an enduring relationship with the GP, the ability for us to have um, you know, potentially greater access to information, um, greater regularity of meetings with the portfolio management team improves. Um, and, and I think the, the other thing that comes with this is, is access as well. If, if you're doing due diligence, if you're screening a universe of funds, but you're not confident that you can get access to all of them, it sort of undermines the screening process. If you only have access to 50% of the universe, your screening process is flawed because you might find that all the good capabilities are in the other 50%. So what, what we're able to do, uh, and, and significantly through our relationship with Mercer, is start that process with a high level of confidence that when we think about how we want to pick a fund, that, that, that the vast majority of funds are available to us. And, and I think that you know, having that technology, having the platform collating that demand uh, is, is a real help. Thank you. Let's turn away from kind of the operational side for a moment and kind of look towards some areas that are potentially thriving within par private market space. So are the 
big areas still dominating or are um, niche segments perhaps like music royalties becoming more attractive? Um, Greta, let me turn to you here. What areas do you see thriving at the moment? So um, we see a lot of uh, interest for strategies focused on uh, impact and energy transition, for instance. Uh, that's a big focus. Uh, so for sure, we're looking at a number of players that are launching thematic funds. Uh, um, at the same time, uh, we also rely on uh, a number of external and uh, external advisors and third parties. Uh, to see what each uh, GP is specialized on. So uh, let's say we're uh, always suggesting to build a well diversified portfolio. So um, interesting, as interesting as these strategies could be, they always have to be part of a diversified pool of uh, commitments. Olivier, which areas are you looking at at the moment and which seem to be thriving to you? Yeah, we, we, we tend to be quite uh, quite traditional. We are we are bankers, um, and uh, we we focus mainly on buyouts. Having said that, we we do see a lot of uh, new GPs uh, or new strategies within existing GPs on 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 impact. Uh, that's for that's for sure. Uh, you don't have that many managers with with quality offering. I would say on this uh, on this thematic. Um, I can only name General Atlantic, for instance, as, as one of the top leaders in the, in the space. Um, but uh, uh, yes, I think um, it, probably inflation hedge uh, is, is an important focus at the moment. So uh, anything related to, to real estate or infrastructure um, is, is of interest to, uh, to, to clients and, and advisors. Um, probably more than, than topics where you, you found a lot of funding and, and dry powder recently, like, like venture and direct lending. We, we, we try to stay away uh, from, this, uh, from these two strategies. So let's let's touch on um, a point that you made there, Greta, about looking at the energy transition um, space. And Anya, I'll come to, come to you for this. So I guess we're seeing quite a rotation of energy companies moving back into the private market space. Is is there a real opportunity here to be able to to, to capitalise on this rotation and capitalise on the energy transition trend? Uh, there's definitely an opportunity from a fundraising point of view, and I think we are seeing a lot of managers trying to take advantage of that uh, of that opportunity. On the investment side, I think there is uh, there is clearly a lot of capital that this space requires to really make that transition. And I would say it's across strategies, whether it's private equity strategies supporting some of the new technology coming, whether it's on the infrastructure side or even on the on the private debt. So the space, I think, is very interesting. I think we need to be very careful that it does deliver returns. And I think to pick up on the point which Olivier made, a lot of these GPs are very new GPs um, with relatively limited experience and track records. So I think we do need to be mindful of the fact that whereas it's a tremendous opportunity and I think it really speaks to a lot of clients whether and actually it seems to appeal to clients across the spectrum. So both on the high net worth side, but also a lot of institutions are also very keen in the space. I think we want to be very mindful in terms of how we actually commit to this space. So we don't waste that opportunity. What then of, of impact driven strategies overall in, in general? What, what's demand like there and is supply a potential issue? Anya, I'll stay with you and then open it out. Sure. Um, so I think a lot of what I said probably applies across the impact space. So we are seeing tremendous interest uh, from everybody. And I think impact means different things to, to different types of clients. And each client has a slightly different definition of impact. But I think I can safely say that we are seeing interest in all approaches. That interest doesn't always uh, transfer the moment into commitments. I think the, you know, people are very excited about the space, but they're also wary of the space. I think we need, yeah, there's more education that's needed on it and I think it will come gradually because it is such a dynamic space, it's such a fast evolving space that uh, people just need to, I think, get a bit more comfort with it. And from a supply perspective, 
Uh, I think I see new managers landing on my desk every couple of days. But so supply is definitely increasing. Um, where I think we're constrained is in terms of supply of quality investable opportunities, you know, because a lot of people have some phenomenal ideas, but not everybody will be able to develop or to deliver on those ideas. And I think like with all new asset classes, um, you know, we don't want people to be burned by their first investments because then it's very hard to get them to come back to an asset class. And if you think back, for example, to what happened with clean tech funds back in 2008, 2009, a lot of those funds didn't really return uh, principal, even let alone positive investment returns. And it's taken the market a long time to recover from that and for people to feel com comfortable to invest in some of those technologies again. So I think that's something that we would really like to avoid to the extent possible with impact. Leslie, how are you um, digging through or being mindful of the, the supply of impact strategies versus the, the ones that will potentially succeed? Yeah, no, I would echo a lot of what Anya said. Firstly, in terms of the demand, like we are getting a lot of demand, a lot of queries, whether it's public markets, private markets. Um, yeah, impact, ESG, responsible investment, clearly it's a big theme right now. Our focus is really on, you know, providing really good reporting and measurement around that. Um, and I think that goes for the supply and selection as well. Trying to find managers with a genuine experience, USP expertise can actually be a little bit more difficult. And again, as Anya mentioned, track record is also quite difficult to find. It is an emerging space though, so that also sort of explains it. But um, definitely there is supply, but actually yeah, finding really good quality and having access to those quality funds can also be difficult. Thank you. Do you find investors' focus on ESG is becoming increasingly specific, say looking at gender or ethnicity or biodiversity? And, and how hard is it to find a fund in the private wealth space that kind of caters to those, those narrow tranches of interest? Adam, Leslie, I'll, I'll, looking at you two, so I will turn to one of you first. Who would like to pick that up? We're not seeing any specific evidence of that ourselves. Um, there is huge interest in ESG broadly. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt in our minds that it, not only is it here to stay, but it's a fundamental part of the decision process. Um, but no, we're not seeing any specific angle that's being approached with ESG and questions that are coming to us to say, can you prove that somebody is doing something in this particular regard? Because that's important to me. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing that quite yet. Greta, are you, are you finding specific demand in terms of ESG or is it still a kind of broad approach from investors? It is kind of broad for the moment, but we're experiencing a lot of questions related to ESG screening. So we get asked a lot by our clients whether there's some ESG screening in place for specific products, which are the criteria and so on. So I think it's a genuine interest still at a relatively broad level. And Olivier, how for, for your clients are you finding um, their approach to ESG? Yeah, I mean, we on, on our due diligence, we, we moved from uh, five questions back uh, in, in 2005 uh, to over 50 questions today on ESG. Uh, so it's clearly a significant part uh, of, the, of the due diligence process. Um, then it's more a question of, of setting the right criteria for the funds in, in which we invest. Do they have an ESG policy? Um, who are the, the, the are the deal makers involved in this uh, in this process? And and we've been I mean we know for sure that uh, a good ESG policy will help uh, delivering returns uh, overall. So we we are convinced that it helps um, resilient returns over time. Um, especially on, from, a, from a governance perspective, uh, the deals, went, the deals uh, uh, which turned badly have been those with, with a lack of governance. Um, and, and it's true that uh, answering this question is quite, uh, is quite key. I think investors are not there yet in terms of what's, what's their expectations uh, for, for, for ESG criteria. Uh, 
um, but we are moving on the right direction and we have to set ourselves uh, the right reportings on these, uh, on these criteria. Anya, how do you then m marry the, the right, as, as Olivia said, the right set of reporting on ESG criteria? That's, there's a lot to cover. There is a lot to cover and I think like Olivier, we're, we've also hugely developed uh, our ESG approach and I think Mercer was always a leader in the space but our approach has also become much deeper. Um, we look at many more factors. We were trying to make it more quantifiable, although to a large extent it will remain a qualitative decision. Um, I think what helps these days is also a lot of, you know, a lot of international standards are appearing. I think at the moment there are maybe a little bit too many, but you know, at some point, I think maybe uh, you know, I'd hate to put a number on it, but let's say in the next three to five years, I think we will see some sort of um, yeah, collation of standards and people preferring maybe two to three, which will make it, I think, much more usable and also much more transparent from a client perspective. Because it's very hard to compare these, uh, you know, these matrix on a portfolio basis if everybody is reporting to a different standard. So, you know, I think it's very much a work in progress. There is no perfection yet. I think, you know, we're, and to be honest, to a large extent, we have to be comfortable with that if we want to invest, um, that this is not a perfect world, but it is one which is evolving. And I think if people, if we're, if we see that people are willing to make the effort and they're moving down the right path, we also have to be able to give them the credit for that and the benefit of the doubt. Leslie, how do you then marry that with, or that sort of approach with your partner firms like if you know you, you and your internal department are, are happy with that level of reporting and and that approach and how do you then communicate to, to your your partner firms and the investors underneath yeah I mean we've made a lot of progress in the past couple of years in terms of um, collating all of that data from managers and also just pushing managers quite frankly to also issue more more data more information collate that that information and then, yeah, c condensing it into a digestible sort of report for clients to have and just to, to see that transparency. And, you know, obviously ESG is one thing and I think we've sort of, you know, nailed that. But we're now moving on to climate, which is the next big thing and carbon footprinting. And again, just really encouraging our managers to be collating that data, communicating that data. And then that allows us in turn to also give partners and clients that transparency. So then in light of investors kind of the seemingly increasing appetite and demand for private markets and, and, and the uptake in it overall, do you think we're witnessing a bubble in the making? Anya, you've talked about being really mindful of, of not falling into the trends, say like clean tech. How are you managing this, um, this demand and, and are investors now just accessing it at the top of the market? Very good question. And I think uh, probably a question that we've already been asking ourselves for the last two, three years. Um, I think a couple of points on that. What I would I think, and picking up on what we've already said, I do think it really is genuinely about the selection and the due diligence. Um, because private equity or private markets generally have proven to be quite a resilient asset class. You know, if we think back to whether it was a financial crisis or then the euro debt crises or, or even COVID, performance overall has remained very strong. Uh, you know, but then it really comes down to who you have actually invested with. And the top managers are the ones who have the experience and the skills to navigate, um, to navigate any potential downturns. That doesn't mean to say they won't have any losses. But looking historically, performance has actually remained strong from those uh, from those top managers, regardless of the cycle. So I think it's you know we've clearly seen a very overheated market in the last few years, and I think we are beginning to see the signs of a slowdown, very very slowly. Whether it's you know fundraising um, timetables being slightly less aggressive than they were even three months ago. Uh, deal flow on the manager side in terms of new investments is beginning to slow down a fraction. So, but I think these are all actually positive and will help to bring the market back into equilibrium. 
but nonetheless, I think, you know, we expect the, the vintages to continue to deliver performance just because it has been a very resilient asset class. Olivier, how are you managing that, the, the demand from clients and, and your mindfulness of it maybe being overheated? Yeah, I will. I will just add uh, to to Anya's point the uh, the enterprise value to to EBITDA level, which is uh, back to uh, probably a, a, a lesser, uh, a smaller multiple. Uh, we see we see reduction in the entry price for for these assets, um, especially in the first first half of this year. I think it's a good thing uh, for the industry. Um, and um, yeah, we we're quite what quite cautious and. As I said, we can't really time this uh, this asset class, uh, so we've been um, building allocations for for many years with some with some clients. It's quite a challenge in in today's environment to to recycle distributions and to invest um, them properly with with the expected returns in line with with what they achieved. So we we are extremely cautious on uh, on this. And Greta, a word from, from you. How are you managing this with your clients? Yeah, I totally agree with Anya on the fact that selection is key. The other key thing to take into consideration is diversification. We see many clients that are eager to put capital to work uh, and we tend to suggest them to pace uh, their commitments across vintages. Super. So finally then, this, this kind of the whole discussion and activity around private markets are so clearly seeing a democratization really in the approach and the access that investors are getting. How long do you think it will be until private markets are truly democratic? Adam, what do you, how far along the time scale are we there? Or should we be truly democratic? So it's, it's a really good question. I mean, democratization means making something accessible to everyone. And for a number of the things that we've touched on today, illiquidity being one of the prim principal things, there it begs the question of should something like that be av available to everyone? And I think the answer should be no, it, it shouldn't actually. It's not, it's not suitable for a large population of investors. I think the way that we look at it is that at the moment, there is a underserved high net worth population who want now the experience that large institutional investors have had over the last 10 to 20 years. And I think what we're seeing in the marketplace now is the development of that appetite and the facilitation of that appetite through all, all of the things that we've covered today. I think then in terms of the true democratization of it, there are a, a, a few things that need to happen. And, and we look at it through three lenses, really. And the first one is, is regulation. You know, and the regulator plays a huge role in this in terms of defining suitability of product, defining the characteristics of a client that, you know, uh, and so I think the regulator has a huge influence on the true democratization of private markets. I think the second lens that we look, look at it through is, is product development. You know, we, we talked earlier about semi-liquid, we're talking about evergreen structures. We're now seeing asset managers start to look at this and think, well, now, is there a way that we can give the, the return profile to, to an investor but without necessarily taking some of the inherent uh, risks? And I think that's a really interesting lens that will have a huge influence on democratization. And then I think the, the, the last one is, is technology again, and it comes back to that issue of scale, is that if you're going to take an asset class that historically has been designed for few larger investors and seriously consider it becoming available for all, you, you, you do have the challenges of scale. And, and I think that's not solved overnight. That's, you know, that's a, 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 a three to five year process. So yeah, I, I think we're nearer the beginning of that journey. I think it's a, a noble goal to have, but there are a few things that need to happen for it to, to, to re really become a reality. Mm. I guess that p plays in, into the work that, that you're doing. Like it's incredible that you're being able to, to bring it basically to the whole of the UK through your partner firms. But scale, I guess, is, is front and centre of, of the challenge that, that you need to overcome to be able to effectively employ this, this strategy. Yeah, look, I mean, we've already come a long way. We already have a fund uh, which has, you know, private assets, which is available to all of our clients. Um, but I think, as Adam mentioned, you know, more product innovation, technology, devising the right advice frameworks as well to deliver the solutions you know there's still a little bit 
more work to do, but I think, you know, it is, ho it is happening as we speak. So I think, you know, touch wood in the near future, we, we should see a lot more of these solutions being rolled out to a wide variety of clients. So perhaps, Anya, perhaps a couple of closing comments. Do you think private markets are the new investment darling? Um, well, given where I sit, I, I think I sort of have to say that they are, right? And if we think of the general economies and, you know, from a size perspective, private markets represent a much larger chunk of the real economy than, uh, than listed equities. So I think it does make sense as an investment perspective. And whether it's, you know, through the innovation that we're seeing and some of the technology changes, as with, for example, Titan Bay, uh, they're really helping to drive that access for parts of the population which did not have access before. Um, so I think it's a, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great moment for private markets from a development and evolution perspective. We've got nodding faces around the room and, and, and virtually, so I think everybody here is in, in agreement that it is certainly an exciting asset class to be looking at at the moment. Thank you all so much for your comments. Thank you for joining me in person. It's been really lovely to have you. That's all we've got time for, I'm afraid, but thank you so much for watching.